Calorie hybrid organic inorganic materials given by, by Juan Manuel Bermudo from the University of Coruña. So, thank you very much. So, first of all, thank you very much to you for the invitation to present part of our research line uh, at the University of Coruña here in, in, in Orate School. So, in this talk, I have prepared like a very didactic talk. So, uh, excuse me, is, this is a little bit uh, simple uh, for, for you. But I just wanted to introduce this innovative field. So I guess there, there were not many experts on the field. So that was the reason behind that. So in this talk, first of all, I'll do a brief introduction to the refrigeration systems that we are using nowadays, the main, environment, the main environmental challenges that we are facing due to these systems. And also, uh, I'm going to talk about solid state refrigerants as an eco-friendly alternative to the fluid, to the gases refrigerants that we are using nowadays, OK? Then I will move towards the varocaloric materials, uh, which are a specific type of solid state uh, material for refrigerate. And here, I will do a general, well, I will talk about the general characterization of those materials. Then I will uh, talk about the uh, evolution over time of those uh, solutions. And I will focus specifically of the fa on the family of hybrid organic inorganic materials with varocaloric effects. Later, I also want to introduce you a completely new type of uh, caloric material that we have discovered and published in the last weeks. And we have na named those compounds as breathing caloric materials. And last but not least, I'm not going to talk about the main conclusions of those works, but I want to talk about the future challenges and opportunities because this is a very open and innovative field where all can contribute. So we can uh, extend the field. So, uh, nowadays, refrigeration is so important that it accounts for around 20% of the global energy consumption, meaning that a fifth part of the total energy that we use in the world is devoted to refrigerate our food, drinks, medicines, electronic devices, cars, buildings, and so on. And even more, by the year 2050, it is expected that the energy that we use to cool down it is going to be higher than the energy that we are using nowadays for warming up. And on top of that, uh, refrigerate, the refrigeration sector accounts for around 4 billion tons of greenhouse emissions per year. And for that reason, uh, the Kigali Agreement and the international, well, and the European FGAS regulation is trying to uh, prohibit to phase out the main refrigerant gases that we are using nowadays, which are fluorinated gases, and those fluorinated gases have a global warming potential of thousands of times that of CO2 meaning that uh, one ton of uh, these fluorinated gases uh, are equivalent to thousands of tons of CO2 emissions. So by the year 2030, it is expected to reduce the use of the up to 80% of, uh, of those gases. So there is no doubt that we need to develop new alternatives. And in order to develop new alternatives, we need to understand how the refrigerant gases work nowadays. So basically, those refrigerant gases uh, make advantage of the phase transition between the gas state and the liquid state. Okay? So if this is a typical phase diagram of temperature versus pressure, you have a gas, and then you can induce a phase transition toward the liquid state. And this transition is going to be exothermic. So this transition releases heat to the atmosphere. And we don't want this heat, so we just release the heat as a residual heat. Okay? And the interesting phase transition is the reverse one. So when the liquid transforms back into the gas state, this is an endothermic transition that absorbs heat from the surrounding, and you can use it in a chamber of a fridge, a freezer, or an air conditioner, right? But then, in order to do that in a cyclic way, you have to drive the transitions back and forward, OK? Well, keeping that in mind, we have two main refrigeration systems nowadays that are extended in the market. The first one is the vapor compression, which probably is the most extended refrigeration technology in the market. Uh, you can find those technologies, for example, in the fridge or the freezer of your home and in the air conditioner of your supermarket or even in your home, right? And then you have absorption refrigeration technologies, which are less extended, 
but uh, you can use them is in small portable fridges, for example, for motorhomes or caravans, and also in quiet places such as hospitals or hotels, right? And also for small water chillers as well. So starting with, this, for, with the first one, with vapor compression, uh, this is a simplification of the system, but basically uh, you start with a gas that is an ambient pressure, I'm sorry, an ambient pressure and ambient uh, temperature. And then you pressurize this gas in an adiabatic way, in a really fast way. So the gas suffers a phase transition towards the liquid state, and this phase transition increases the temperature of the liquid. So you end up with a pressurized liquid that is hot. It's hotter than the ambient, uh, the ambient temperature. Then if you give time to the system to reach the equilibrium, this excess of heat is released to the, is released to the atmosphere uh, through the back of the fridge, for example. Okay, and uh, the liquid uh, that is still under pressurization reach out the uh, room temperature again. Now we do the depressurization of the system in an adiabatic way again. So you drive the reverse phase transition towards the gas state, and this is an endothermic transition in which the uh, gas uh, is cooled down. So you have a gas that is under uh, room temperature, right? is below room temperature. And now that you have a cold gas, you can use this cold gas to absorb heat from a chamber of a fridge, a freezer, or from a room if you are using an air condition. And that, was, will be, that could be the, the basics of a refrigeration cycle using a vapor compression. Well, nowadays, vapor compression is probably one of the most efficient systems in the market, so the efficiency is, is, is quite high. Uh, the technology is also quite simple, so that's that, that are the two main reasons why those systems are the most extended in the market. But on the downside, they're using fluorinated gases, which have a global warming potential of thousands of times larger than that of CO2. And even if they are not using uh, some uh, gases, they can find some gases that did not have this uh, global warming potential, uh, the alternative could be flammable gases, such as hydrocarbons, okay? So that's another uh, uh, drawback. Another important limitation is the noise that makes the compression. So you cannot use, or this system are not gonna be suitable for calm and quiet places such as hospitals or hotels. Trying to avoid uh, some of these limitations, specifically that of the greenhouse emissions, the refrigeration sector nowadays is moving towards the use of uh, CO2 as a refrigerant gas. And why CO2? Because, as I said, CO2 has a global warming potential of thousands of times less than that of fluorinated gases. And uh, this is a good excuse to encourage the companies to recover the CO2 that they are producing in other processes and put the CO2 back into the market so we can could do a good use instead of just releasing as a residual, as a, as a waste, right? But uh, the CO2 has two important limitations. One is that about 31 Celsius, this is a critical point where the CO2 becomes a supercritical fluid. So you cannot drive back the transition towards the liquid state above this temperature, even if you pressurize CO2. So CO2 is really difficult to work with uh, in really hot areas, such as, for example, well, the south of Spain, right? And the other limitation is that even if you work with CO2 at ambient temperature, the pressure that you need to drive the phase transition, it is gonna be about 60 bar. And normally, the traditional uh, refrigeration gases, the fluorinated gases, work around 10 bar. So this is a six-fold increase in the pressure demand, so the efficiency of your system is gonna decrease. So in comparison with the previous traditional vapor compression systems, the efficiency of the CO2 compression uh, decreases, the technology complexity increases because you are gonna have to put materials that can stand such large pressures, so, uh, and you have to have a compressor that reaches higher pressures, so the technology is also more complex, but, uh, but on the positive side, uh, you decrease the global warming potential of the refrigerant that you are using, and this CO2 is not gonna be flammable. But again, the other important limitation is that it's really difficult to work with CO2 in environments, in climates, that uh, are above 31 Celsius. And what about the absorption refrigeration? As I said, this is a less, much less common system. 
And the basic principles, again, this is a simplification of, of the system, consist basically on an adsorbent that can be solid or liquid, and then a liquid that evaporates under uh, the presence of vacuum. So this vacuum is going to help the evaporation of the liquid, and this evaporation is going to absorb heat from the surroundings. So this process is the one that is going to cool down your fridge or your water chiller. Then, uh, in order to recover this gas, the gas gets absorbed in the adsorbent, but this process is going to release heat. And this heat that you don't want, you have to release it to the atmosphere as a residual heat. In order to recover and transform back this absorbed uh, gas into the liquid state to make the process cycl cyclable, you need to provide an, ex an external heat source in order to detach the gas and transform back into liquid. So in this case, you are not using a compressor to pressurize back the gas into the liquid state, but you are using a heat source to recover this, uh, this heat and transform back into the liquid so you can have a cyclic process, right? In comparison to with the previous two, uh, the assertion system has, uh, have a much lower uh, efficiency. The technology is going to be also high because you require vacuum in order to facilitate this evaporation. But again, the positive side is that the global warming potential is quite low, and they are not normally flammable refrigerants. But uh, those refrigerants, sometimes, uh, such as ammonia, they can be corrosive or toxic refrigerants. So that's a downside here in, in those technologies. So what other alternatives could we have in order to find efficient uh, refrigeration systems that are also friendly with the environment and the user? In the last decades, uh, scientists have been working on solid-to-solid -solid phase transitions that have attached an exothermic and endothermic uh, uh, heat exchange as well. So we can make use, instead of a gas to liquid and a liquid to gas phase transition, we can make use of a phase transition between two different solid states. Okay, so in the first transition, that will be exothermic. This releases heat that we don't want to use. We release uh, as, a, as, a, as a waste, and then, we drive back the transition, and this endothermic transition can absorb the heat that we decide to put down. Okay? So uh, how can we drive uh, the transition? We can use different stimuli. Uh, for example, we can use magnetic field, and in that way, we are going to have magnetocaloric materials. Caloric is the thermal change, and the magneto is the prefix that indicates the, the field that you, are inducing to, or that you are using to induce the phase transition. Then we can have electrocaloric materials where we are using electric fields, elastocaloric materials where the uh, field is going to be an aniaxial stress, extension or, or adhesion or compression, and probably the most uh, similar materials to the vapor compression refrigerants are going to be the so called barocaloric materials where you are uh, putting an hydrostatic or isostatic pressure on the material in order to drive this phase transition. And that's the reason why we are focusing of, on this specific family of materials, because in principle, they will be more easily to implement in the technology than the rest of them, because the technology is already there, but they are using gases, OK? Well, advantages of barocaloric materials over other fluids. The first one could be a bit obvious. Uh, they offer zero emissions, because they are solid state materials, so they cannot escape to the atmosphere. Right? The second one, they help towards the circular economy. Since they cannot escape to the atmosphere, if there is a leak, it is easier to recover and reuse those materials. Then they also offer a space saving because a solid refrigerant is going to be more, co more compact than a liquid or a gas a refrigerant. And, sorry. and they also offer safer transport and, man and manipulation because uh, the, the refrigerant gases has to be transported in pressurized vessels, and a solid can be transported in just ambient pressure, right? And uh, they, the, these solids are not going to be flammable or toxic, most of them, but even if they were, they are not volatile compounds, so you cannot inhale them. The next question will be, uh, how can we use those solid materials in order to uh, have a cooling power to refrigerate? Uh, the most typical refrigeration cycle to describe the refrigeration effect of a solid barocaloric material will be that of the uh, inverse Brighton cycle uh, that represents 
the entropy of the system versus the temperature. And again, in a similar way to the vapor compression systems, you start with a, a solid phase one where the ions or molecules that are present in this solid has a certain, some, some degree of freedom, so they are moving, they are vibrating, right? Uh, and you start at ambient pressure and ambient temperature, and then if you pressurize in adiabatic conditions, so you are restricting the movement of those atoms, you are changing the phase transition, so you go towards a solid phase two, which is more shorter than the previous one, and this process, which is isothermic, makes the material uh, heat up, okay? And now that you have a material that is warm, you give time the system to reach the equilibrium, releasing the excess of heat, and the material, which is still under this solid phase two, uh, under pressurization, uh, reaches back the ambient temperature. Again, we do the same as in the vapor compression systems. We release the heat or the pressure in an adiabatic way, and these molecules can start moving again. But this process, which is endothermic, decreases the temperature of this solid phase one, and this solid phase one, which is now cold, can be used to extract heat from the desired device. And we can repeat this cycle over and over in order to reach the temperature that we, we want to reach. So from this Brighton cycle, we can extract two important uh, parameters in order to characterize and identify the, the, the caloric uh, potential or the cooling potential of, of our materials and compare them with other barocaloric materials. And these two parameters are on the one hand, the adiabatic temperature change of the material, and the other one will be the isothermal entropy change. But in the literature, most of the experimental studies have been focused over the years mainly on the isothermal entropy change because uh, the equipments that are in the lab uh, can characterize uh, better, like the heat flow of the material, better than the temperature change in adiabatic conditions. And for that reason, in this talk, I'm gonna focus mainly on this isothermal entropy change. Those two uh, parameters are also known as pressure-induced thermal changes or barocaloric effects. So when we talk about, when we talk about barocaloric effects, we have to distinguish between this one and this one. We have to uh, identify which one are we talking about. Well, so for a barocaloric materials, in order to be a good refrigerant, it has to be it has to have very large thermal changes or barocaloric effects, but also this material has to have the solid to solid phase transition near room temperature. And that is quite obvious because if we are gonna implement them in a fridge, the fridge is gonna work at room temperature. So we want this phase transition to be able to be induced uh, under room conditions, right? Then uh, on top of that, we want as well that this material cannot only work at 25 Celsius or 20 Celsius, but we want this material to work in a wide range of operating temperature, which is called temperature span. Because uh, the climate varies a lot, it's, it changes a lot uh, across the world and across the seasons, so we want this fridge to work in winter and in summer and in, in north of Spain, south of Spain, in different areas, right? So we want a, a material that can adapt to the different climates. Then uh, it has to have a very large response towards pressure, meaning that the less pressure that you can apply in order to induce a phase transition, the less energy you are going to need uh, to the system to operate, for the system to operate, so you, reduce, you increase the efficiency. This is a measure in terms of barocaloric coefficient, which is different from the barocaloric effects, and this coefficient can be measured as the transition temperature dependence with the, pre the pressure, meaning how much you can shift your transition temperature when you apply the pressure. And then another important parameter is the thermal hysteresis. You would like or you want your material to have a low thermal hysteresis, which is the transition temperature on cooling and on heating. I will explain that uh, a little bit uh, further later. Uh, and the lower is this thermal hysteresis, the most efficient in principle will be your material. I'm going to explain that uh, in a bit. Well, how do we characterize all those parameters? As Matt explained before, the main technique for characterizing the thermal properties of these barocaloric uh, materials is gonna be the differential scanning calorimetry. As you already explained this technique, so I'm not gonna dip a lot in that, but basically uh, you register the heat flow of your material, the heat that is uh, exchanged by your material, like 
releasing heat or absorbing heat upon the transition, right? And for that, you can study the material by increasing the temperature. So first, you start in a low temperature phase, you increase the temperature of your material, and at some point, this material transforms in a high temperature phase. And this, uh, this transition, it is gonna be endothermic, okay? And then, from this peak, you do the integration and you can calculate the latent heat or the enthalpy change associated to this transition, meaning the, the heat that is absorbed during the transition, and then you can know as well the transition temperature, which is the temperature at which this transition takes place. And you can reverse the transition and you obtain the information from the high temperature trans, uh, phase to the low uh, temperature phase. So that will be the characterization of your material under ambient pressure and as a function of the temperature. But what we would like to do is to study the material as a function of pressure because we want to know what is the, this heat absorbed or releases when you apply the pressure, okay? So from this preliminary st study, you can have some uh, information like how, uh, what is gonna be the, the maximum enthalpy and entropy chain associated to the phase transition. And you can also know what is the transition temperature of your material under ambient pressure as well as the thermal hysteresis. So you can obtain these three parameters from this basic characterization. But then uh, you put, uh, you play with the pressure uh, and there are two main methods that you can use to obtain uh, data uh, from differential scan uh, scanning calorimetry under pressure. So the first, the first type of methods are called direct methods and they are less common because it is diff really difficult to find a laboratory in the world that can have this kind of calorimeters. So you have a calorimeter that can not only do ramps uh, in temperature, but they are coupled with a pressure cell and this pressure cell is able to first fix an isothermal condition, a given temperature, and then the cell can increase and, and decrease the pressure in a controlled way, right? They can do ramps. So in this uh, way, you can put your material in the high temperature phase, and then you pressurize the material and drive the transition towards the low temperature phase by increasing the pressure. Here you have pressure, here you have the heat flow. And then you reach a pressure where the material drives this phase transition, right? So you can calculate from here directly the enthalpy and entropy change which is associated to your material under pressurization. You do that as well under deep pressurization and you have the reverse transition. And you can do that over and over again in order to test the, uh, the stability of your material over time, okay? But as I said, this is the less common characterization that you can find in the literature because those calorimeters are not very common. Uh, there are other types of uh, differential scanning calorimeters that are also coupled with pressure cells, but these pressure cells cannot control a pressurization ramp, but they can provide isobaric conditions. So you put a fixed uh, pressure inside this cell, and then you do uh, temperature ramps, like in a traditional uh, DSC, okay? So in that way, what you have is a heat flow as a function of temperature on heating and cooling, but for different pressures. You start an ambient pressure, do a run or a scan, then you increase the pressure, keep it in isobaric condition, and uh, keep changing this, this pressure, right? So you have a standard DSC, but different, uh, at different pressures. What you can see from here, uh, well, I, I didn't mention, but that's, these are known as quasi-direct methods because you're not measuring directly the, the enthalpy change associated with pressurization, but you are just calculating from those data. So the first uh, thing that comes to your sight is that this phase transition in traditional valocaloric materials shift towards higher temperatures when you increase the pressure, right? And from this data, you can build a phase diagram of temperature versus pressure, uh, similar to the phase diagram that I showed you for the refrigerant gases. And on heating, which is gonna be the maximum of those peaks, and on cooling. So from here, you have all those points, and you have two parameters that we have mentioned before. First, you have the transition temperature dependence with the pressure, which is, was the, the valoric, valocaloric coefficient or the uh, pressure responsiveness of the, your material. So the larger is this slope, the more sensible is your material towards the, the pressure. And then you have the thermal hysteresis, which is gonna be the difference between the transition temperature on heating and on cooling, okay? 
And this thermal hysteresis is really important because if you have a low thermal hysteresis, you have to apply a very small pressure to drive the transition from the phase one to the phase two. But if you increase the thermal hysteresis, then this pressure is, is not enough, and you have to increase the pressure. So you are putting more energy into the system, less efficient is going to be your system. And then, so lower hysteresis means less required pressure, which means that the efficiency is going to increase. And then, in terms of the barocalorie coefficient, so the larger is this slope, the smaller is going to be the pressure required to drive the transition. So these two parameters are really important uh, in order to design a, a material for barocaloric properties. Well, we have already talked about uh, how to characterize the uh, transition temperature of your material. We have talked about uh, how to calculate the barocaloric coefficient and how this caloric, uh, barocaloric coefficient impacts your efficiency, and also the same for the thermal hysteresis. How do we calculate the barocaloric effects here in terms of isothermal entropy change from those quasi-direct methods, and how do we calculate the operating temperature range, this temperature span in which your material can present barocaloric effects in order to be able to be adaptable to different climates. For that, what you do is that the barocaloric uh, effect in terms of isothermal entropy change is defined as the entropy change of your phase transition at the maximum pressure minus the entropy change of your phase transition at the pressure at which you start, the ambient pressure, okay? So you have to calculate these two entropy changes, and this is quite a straightforward. You just do the integration of both, both peaks, and then you do the subtraction, right? Uh, the integration is gonna give you the enthalpy change of the, seat, of the, of the system, the, the latent heat, but, and then you just divide it by the transition temperature, which is the maximum of the peak, and you have the entropy change, okay? So, uh, with an example, uh, let's do that first for the cooling ramps. Remember that that was on heating and cooling, heating and cooling. So, uh, if we do that integration for both peaks on the cooling ramps, we have something like that, okay? Then, we do the subtraction, and this subtraction is gonna give some curve similar to that one, and that is the curve which is called the isothermal entropy change of barocaloric effect. And as you can see, as you shift in temperature, this barocaloric effect is gonna be slightly different, okay? And that will be the maximum. Uh, but remember, we have done that on cooling, and if you go back to the solid, uh, solid phase transition, Cooling down a material is an exothermic uh, process because you start in the high temperature phase and go to the low temperature phase, so this uh, exothermic transition releases heat, and that will be equivalent to applying pressure, which is also an exothermic uh, transition. So in, in overall, uh, cooling down is uh, equivalent to applying pressure, and both are exothermic uh, uh, transition that releases heat, and this heat we are not gonna use it for cooling. We just want to get rid of those, this, this heat, no? So the interesting part will be to characterize as well the uh, process, the rubber process, where you have the, um, sorry, okay, where you have um, the endothermic transition. So we do that as well for the heating parts, and we have an inverse curve, very similar, which is shifted due to this thermal hysteresis, uh, and you can calculate the barocaloric, you can obtain the barocaloric coefficient, or no, sorry, the barocaloric effect uh, on cooling and on heating because this process has to be reversible in order to use it as many times as you want. That's the reason behind you are doing the characterization on cooling and on heating, which is equivalent to uh, pressurize the material and depressurize the material. So from here, we obtain the maximum or the value of the barocaloric bar uh, bar effect that we can use for, cool, for cooling uh, uh, at different temperatures. And this temperature range over here is the range in which your material exhibits barocaloric effects. So that will be your temperature span or the operating temperature range for your material. So your material can work in all these range of temperature because if you go over here, so you cannot recover the heat. If you go over here, you don't have caloric effect neither. So your materials can only work here. 
Okay, so now we know what is a valocaloric material. We know how to characterize or to do the basic characterization of those valocaloric materials. And I would like to uh, show you a bit of the evolution over time of the different valocaloric materials that have been studied over the years, in the last uh, decades. This is a very rich down field, uh, like 30 years old uh, field, that of valocaloric materials. And the target, well, first of all, here I'm representing the isothermal entropy change, which is the valocaloric effect, versus the pressure that you need to apply to your material in order to reach this, this valocaloric effect. And the target to it will be that of the refrigerant gases. So refrigerant gases are around 500 uh, joules per Kelvin per kilogram, okay? And their pressures below 60, 60 bar, which is uh, the maximum for the CO2, but normally are gonna be between 10, 20, okay? So the first materials that were studied for barocaloic purposes, the solid state materials, were metallic alloys. As you can imagine, to compress a metal is gonna be very hard, so to dry a solid, solid phase transition in a metal is gonna be really hard. So they needed to apply really, really large pressures, over 1,000 bar, okay? Which is far from the commercial needs. And the entropy change was also uh, quite far from the refrigerant gases. Then the field moved on to inorganic salts, so they managed to improve the entropy change, but the pressure were similar. And in our, in our research group uh, in 2017, we were able for the first time to dramatically reduce the pressure required for inducing those solid to solid phase transition using a hybrid organic and inorganic materials, which I'm, gonna, I'm going to explain uh, in a bit. And the entropy changes, although still far from the refrigerant gases, were more or less in the same range of the previous barocaloric materials, okay? So we did uh, an advance in the, in the field. Why those hybrid organic and inorganic materials were so responsive towards the pressure? Well, for that, we focus on a family of hybrid materials which are known as hybrid perovskites. I'm sure that many of you already know those, those hybrid perovskites, okay? This is the basic structure with a general formula ABX3. Uh, so you have in the corner BX6 oxahedra, and in the middle you have pseudo cuboxahedral cavities where you can put different cations. So in our case, or in the case, in the general case of hybrid perovskites, in the A position in those cavities, you can put mid sized alkylammonium cations, for example, mesilammonium, dimesilammonium, nimidazolium, and so on. In the B position, you can put a transition metal cations, okay? And in the X position, the ligands that are linked in the two different uh, B centers, uh, traditionally, or the most famous ones nowadays, maybe are allies because of the solar cells, but you can put polyatomic uh, bidentate bridge ligands, such as cyanides, formates, acides, and so on. So we are increasing the cavity, and you can allocate here bigger cations, okay? And we focus in this uh, kind of, of uh, materials, uh, specifically uh, on a family of material where the X ligand was quite large, five atoms X ligand, it is called diazanamide, nitrogen, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and then the cavity is very large, so we could allocate tetrapropyl ammonium cations. And as you can imagine, the reason behind the large responsiveness towards pressure of those materials is gonna be the large uh, flexibility of those building blocks. So you can compress those materials very easily. Uh, if you want to implement a material into the market, the first thing that you th need to think about is, is this synthesis eco-friendly, cheap, fast, scalable, well put. But uh, in the case of our materials, uh, this synthesis uh, fulfilled all the requirements because it was quite simple. We were using uh, an aqua solution with a bit of ethanol with the different chemicals, and then if we did a slow evaporation, we were able to obtain different materials by using different B transition cations of manganese, iron, cadmium, nickel, and cobalt uh, in the form of single crystals, so we can do the whole characterization in, in single crystal, but we'll see that the size is around uh, in the in millimeter scale, but we were able as well to decrease the evaporation time that was like uh, between a week and a month, okay? But if uh, we increase the speed of, of the evaporation with a rotatory evaporator in terms of minutes, we were able to obtain the same materials 
but in the form of fine powders. So that will be very interesting for the, for the industry, right? Well, uh, that was a small puntualization. Uh, so those materials, which are very flexible and sensible to the, to the pressure, uh, has also to have a very large entropy change of the system when it goes from a given state to another state, right? And we found by single crystal XRD that the low temperature phase, uh, in the low temperature phase, those tetrapopyl ammonium cations and the ligands were relatively ordered. Meanwhile, when you increased the temperature, you uh, drive, drive a phase transition towards a more disordered state. And the entropy change between these two states were very large in comparison with the previous value caloric materials. And even more, we studied the uh, effects of the pressure on, the, and, uh, on, the, on those materials, and we observed that we were able to induce this phase transition by starting in this specific phase and applying pressure, we could go towards this pressure and then under the depressurization, we can go back to this state. So we, can, we could drive the transition uh, upon temperature and also by applying pressure. So that um, a specific material fulfill uh, the main requirements to be a promising barocaloric material. So, uh, we have already seen that uh, this material is not going to enter in the characterization because I have already explained that. We saw that this uh, material, I have already uh, shown you that this material has an entropy change similar to the metallic uh, alloys and to inorganic barocaloric materials, but it did have a small, uh, well, not a small, an important uh, limitation, and it was the temperature, the temperature span, the range in which those materials could operate. So in this uh, slide, I'm showing you the temperature, the temperature span of different materials uh, as a function of the pressure that you, you need to apply in order to make those materials able to work in this, in this range. Uh, these two are refrigerant gases. As you can see, they work near room temperature in a wide range, okay? Uh, this is CO2. So the CO2 need, you need more pressure to, to operate. And if you compare this temperature span with that of the metallic alloys, even they work at room temperature, the span largely decreases, okay, for the metallic alloys. That's obvious because you need more pressure to induce the phase transition. So the phase transition is not going to shift that much for metallic alloys. Uh, the inorganic salts uh, was a bit larger, but they operate quite above uh, room temperature, so you cannot use them for uh, ambient applications, and in the case of hybrid organic and organic materials, since we were applying uh, small pressures, the operating temperature change was also very small. And in this case, we could reach temperature near room temperature, somehow like 330 Kelvin, but other hybrid materials were far away from this ambient temperature. So we decided to explore the literature, trying to find new materials that can fulfill not only the entropy change and the pressure requirement, but also the temperature span. And we decided to explore other hybrid perovskites, but instead of using diazanamide ligands in the exposition, we were searching for materials with different ligands, asides, uh, formates, and even a light perovskite, where you keep the organic parts in the middle of the pseudocoboxhydral cavities. For that, what we did was to identify materials that were already reported uh, with uh, phase transitions, driving by temperature. So with a phase transition that you drive with temperature, you can obtain the, the enthalpy change associated to this phase transition, but driving by temperature instead of by pressure, and you can have an estimation on how large is going to be your value caloric effect at the end, right? And you can also check at which temperature does this transition occur. So we identify several materials, up to 16 materials, uh, that we published in this small review, and we found that from all these, or within all these families, the most interesting family of materials would be that of acide perovskites because they work near room temperature, and they exhibited uh, uh, thermal changes, entropy, thermal entropy changes, but uh, induced with temperature, about 100 joules per Kelvin per kilogram, okay, which was a uh, very large in comparison with the previous uh, barocaloric compounds. 
So we tested some of these sites and other groups in parallel started to study as well uh, hybrid organic and organic materials for valor caloric purposes. And we really did uh, found that the entropy change induced by pressure increased by at the expense of uh, applying more pressures. Okay. Then uh, other types of uh, other families of, of materials started to, to be explored for barocaloric purposes. As I said, that was a very young uh, field. So people have been incorporated into the field in the last uh, years. Uh, so they have studied as well organic polymers, which are quite promising, uh, but still the pressures are quite, are quite high. Then spin crossovers material, where you can induce the phase transition, uh, the spin transition with pressure as well, very promising, but still uh, at high pressures. And one really interesting family is that of organic plastic crystals, where you have a transition between a crystalline uh, state and a plastic state that can be reversible. And they managed to reach entropy change values very near or similar to the refrigerant gases, but still you have to apply a very large pressure. So we are reaching the point of being competitive with the refrigerant gases. The field is reaching the, that point. But there is still a limitation, which is that of decreasing the pressure that you require for a uh, drive this phase transition. In terms of the temperature span of those materials that have been evolving over time, uh, we managed to improve the temperature span of the calorie of the hybrid materials closer to room temperature and larger than, than before, but at the expense of using more pressure. Organic plastic crystals, uh, they keep I kept improving the, the temperature span of, of the operating temperature for the materials. Spin crossovers, really close to, and really wide, and close to room temperature. And for me, one of the most interesting materials in this, in this field in the recent years, in terms of temperature span, is that of organic polymers, which extended the, the operating temperature range uh, beyond that of the refrigerant gases, but again, at the expense of using very high pressures. So there is no doubt that there is a gap where we need to have a temperature span near or similar to the refrigerant gases with entropy changes and pressures similar to those gases that are, are we using nowadays in the, in the market, right? And for that, we kept exploring an even more flexible family of hybrid material, which is that of a metal organic frameworks or MOVs, because here, you don't have the constriction of the peruscate structure, so you don't have a limitation in terms of the ligand that you use. You can use longer ligands for, longer ligands for those uh, structures, and they are going to be more flexible. And we focus in a really, really interesting family that have been around uh, for years, for, uh, since maybe 2000s, or the 90s, I don't remember now, uh, 2000s, I think. Um, which is a family uh, known as uh, mill materials, uh, metal organic frameworks that are denominated mill, which have a very interesting transition, which is known as breathing transition. So this uh, kind of materials, when you pressurize them, well, I don't know if you have heard about metal organic frameworks, but they are, frame, uh, they are materials that are very porous. So they are normally used to absorb and separate selectively gases. So the hybrid peruscites are very dense materials, so they cannot absorb gases. Uh, metal organic frameworks have very open pores, so you can allocate gases in there, okay? They, they can be used to absorb gases. That was the main field for the, for the metal organic frameworks. Actually, uh, they were uh, promising materials because they were comparable by the time, and now they are much better than the zeolites for, for gas absorption, right? So this specific family of materials have a phase transition, which is called breathing transition and consists on pressurizing the material with CO2, and this CO2 open the cavities of your material, so you increase the capacity of absorption of the material, and then when you decrease the pressure, the transition is reversible. So this transition was studied because of its beauty, because it was something that was never uh, studied before, but it did not have many applications beyond gas absorption. So here in this state, you could allocate more gas, more CO2, so you increase the absorption here, okay? In our research group, in the last years, we have been focusing on studying these MOVs, uh, but not for gas absorption, but the thermal changes associated to those transitions, okay? And we observe 
that when you drive the transition upon pressurization, your materials heat up, it is an exothermic uh, transition, and then when you release the pressurization, your material cool down, and now that it's cold, you can use it to absorb. It is really interesting that here you have two contributions to these thermal changes. First, you have the solid to solid phase transition, the contribution of the lattice. So there is a lattice that is changing the phase, okay? So this is one contribution. And then you have another contribution, and it is the adsorption, desorption of the CO2 in the framework, which is interacting with the framework creating a hydrogen bonds. So you have two main contributions here, solid to solid phase transition, which will be equivalent to the barocaloric effect, and absorption desorption process, which will be equivalent to the absorption refrigeration systems. And both contributions add on, and then you end up with a given value for the isothermal entropy change, okay? So, for the first time, with those materials, we observed that we were here, so close to the refrigerant gases, 300 joules per Kelvin per kilogram, by uh, using only 16 bars. So we were in the target of the refrigerant gases. And what about the operating temperature range? Well, in that case, we also observed, very interestingly, that we were able to operate the material in this temperature span. So we increased the temperature span of our material beyond that of the refrigerant gases, and what it is even more interesting is that we are using CO2 to pressurize the system. And remember that the CO2 could not operate above 31 Celsius. And in this way, we are able to use the CO2 beyond this critical point so you can extend the use of CO2 for uh, ambient applications, right, in, in warmer areas. So this is just a, a, let's say, fundamental study, a characterization of the thermal properties. So we, cannot, we have not used uh, the material yet. We have not implemented uh, the material in a prototype. So we will need to study the efficiency of this material in a real working condition, right? But so far, it looks quite promising. Talking about these prototypes uh, that, that I have mentioned, we have started now to build prototypes to test different families of materials. I'm going to be real quick here. And the first prototype that we have designed so far, it is working with, a, well, by the way, we named those uh, materials as breathing caloric materials because they were not absorption materials, they were not barocaloric materials, but it was a combination of them. So we named a new family of, of materials here. And we decided for the breathing because the breathing transition was already described. So, in terms of prototypes, we are working first with barocaloric materials because they are much more simple to understand. Uh, and we have designed a very small proof of concept uh, made of a piston in which you can induce the phase transition just with the force of your footstep. That is to demonstrate that you, in the future you might implement those caloric materials in tiles, floors, or shoes that can auto refrigerate with the movement of your body. Okay? And actually, by using the, the force of your first step, we were able to refrigerate or to decrease the temperature of your material by a couple, three, three Celsius. Which is not much, but in terms of human body temperature, three Celsius is a lot. This is a piston, the standard piston where you put your material, a thermocouple, and a pressure sensor, and you register the, the curves in terms of, uh, as a function of time, of temperature, and the pressure and force that you're applying. This, uh, this uh, barocaloric scale uh, that we have, we have designed uh, is now in a museum exhibition in Galicia, which is called Galicia Futura. Uh, it's a, a, a museum that exhibits the art and science of Galicia in the last years uh, for the Sacobeo Holy Year, 2021-2022. So if you go there, now it is in A Coruña, and then will be in other parts of Galicia, maybe Vigo. So it is itinerating. It is for, it is like, two or three months in a place, and it kept moving. We have been as well uh, on a TV show, a Spanish TV show, those Spanish uh, maybe know Orbita Laica, so we have been in Orbita Laica showing this, this device. And now, as I promised, just to sum up, uh, I would like to uh, talk about the future challenges and opportunities in this field. The first of all would be to find new materials and new caloric effects to increase the portfolio of available materials in order to replace the refrigerant gases. So there is a huge uh, work to do here. 
also, uh, it is necessary to fully understand the mechanisms behind uh, those thermal properties at all levels, uh, molecular dynamics, for example, or GFT. Uh, but as well, it is necessary to improve some of these thermal properties, such as, for example, thermal conductivity, because you are using organic uh, building blocks there that are decreasing the, the thermal conductivity in comparison with inorganic materials. So this is a huge opportunity here as well to study the long-term chemical and mechanical stability of your materials, and of course, designing new prototypes and testing those prototypes under real working conditions. With that, I just want to thank uh, my colleagues from the University of A Coruña, the different centers, and as well as the external collaborators with whom we are collaborating in, in the same field, but in different uh, branches of the, of the field. Uh, and of course, the funding and all of you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very didactic and exciting talk. Time for questions. Hello, thank you for your presentation. It was quite nice. Uh, I was wondering how these materials are like uh, put in place like in a device or sorry i can i cannot hear you how are these materials are put in in a device like uh, are they like in bulk like in powder or they are like grown like in some sort of film yeah or? that's something that we are working on now uh, the design of the prototypes basically the most interesting thing would be to use them as uh, in the in the shape of of powder okay uh, because in that way you can the, the finer is your powder you can extract better the heat because at the end you need uh, a heat transfer medium in order to extract all the heat that is generating and put that heat away, and then in order to drive the heat from the outside onto your material. Okay. So the, the thinner it is your material, the easier it will be to transfer the heat in, this heat in principle. Okay, okay. Thank you. More questions? Out of curiosity, I have actually two questions. One on the uh, this breathing mode uh, metal framework. Uh, from the topology that it has with its rotating internal squares, it's very reminiscent of certain meta materials that happen to have a negative uh, Poisson ratio. Do these materials have that? Uh, to be honest, I cannot respond to that. <laughs> no, 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 I have no idea. So basically those materials, they have like it is not the typical phase transition upon pressurization. So when you pressurize a material, uh, a material that is, that is dense, when you pressurize this material, you have a, a, a typical compression, like a compressibility of the material, material compressed, right? But in this case, you are applying pressure, and instead of compressing your material, you are expanding the material because you are introducing gas here. So you have a negative compressibility here, uh, right? And this. Uh, transition, when you apply pressure to a barocaloric material, you compress, and this uh, reduction of the volume, uh, that is uh, exothermic, okay? So it's like the gas to liquid, exothermic. But uh, here, you have an expansion, so that will be endothermic. And this has a, a opposite sign to the side of the gas. So the gas is contracting, not expanding. So you have an endothermic transition due to the expansion of the, of the framework, and then you have an exothermic transition due to the contraction of the CO2 inside your system. So they are opposites inside, uh, uh, and the difference, I mean, one is decreasing the other one, so the, the overall response, the overall caloric response of your material is gonna decrease, but both uh, mechanisms cannot happen one without the other. So even if you are decreasing a bit the thermal response of your material, you need uh, this phase transition to occur in order to gain more porosity to absorb more heat uh, there. So they have like an inverse behavior as expected for other materials. Okay, thanks. I would have to think a little bit about what it means. Yeah, it's, it's quite good. We are, we are, we're still keep thinking about how to explain in full detail the mechanism behind that, yeah. More questions?
thank you so much for this uh, this talk so i have a very basic question regarding the okay so i have a very basic question regarding the initial slides that you have shown like uh, various methods so, so like uh, in a table like uh, like vapor compression and all the methods and uh, what's the efficiency or like uh, whether it is good or not like efficiencies technical complexities and all the things yes that you have mentioned so i have a question regarding that so like uh, do you choose any kind of like do the companies choose any kind of multi criteria decision making approach to figure out like uh, which way to uh, which uh, which thing we need to use or something like that because everyone have some kind of uh, like every criteria has some kind of weightage yes because, so do the company i don't know about like whether how the companies do that like whether they use any kind of multi criteria decision making analysis or something like that to it's a non trivial question but like i'm just uh, asking out of curiosity because do the companies use any kind of uh, this kind of multi criteria well that's a really complex question that has many many possible answers but at the end is at terms of a uh, how efficient is going to be your your system in terms of energy right how cheap it is going to be your system because it's not really, not only the 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 technology complexity of that system because at the end you can find in uh, in 5 years a new way to build the system in a cheaper way but also uh, those refrigerant that you are using are easily available how is the synthesis of those materials is going to be cheap is not going to be cheap uh, do they degrade over time uh, so you have a lot of different uh, approaches to decide which is the best synth uh, system to use there so uh, it's not that there is only one one system that is going to be like the star system for every application but it also depends as well on the application for example uh, the breathing caloric materials only works with a, a pressurized gas meanwhile the barocaloric materials you can induce the pressure with your foot or i don't know uh, with a, a liquid or by mechanical pressure vibration and so on so depending on on the market you are going to use one technology or the other for example in hospitals uh, this absorption refrigeration although it is less efficient and more complex it's going to be more suitable because the you keep low the 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 noise so for the patients Uh, to have a fridge that is making a lot of noise is not going to help to the recovery right so it is a balance between different so like uh, for different like for different criteria for like based on your application you can put a weightage and uh, figure out like which things will work for you so maybe yeah that's a that's Yeah you you need to find a niche for your application okay, okay i got it. thank you Hey, one question on my side. What, what how do the the copper or the, the the cooling efficiency compare between barocaloric and Peltier cooling? I don't know if you didn't show it for for some maybe it's, it's very very low uh, efficiency for Peltier cooling. So actually for Peltier cooling you can have the the uh, the overall efficiency of the system because it has been already implemented in fridges but in barocaloric since there are not any actual device it is really difficult to compare that so there were not studies so far on comparison between Peltier cooling and and barocaloric so this is an evolving field that's why uh, i mentioned that this is a, a field full of opportunities and and, and areas to explore there Thanks. More questions? No? No last questions? So we thank again. Thank you.